Hi, everybody. Um, this is Bobby Corrigan. I'm coming to you virtually on this particular session. And um, probably if you're at the Purdue Conference or watching here, you are familiar with me. I mean, I've been a Purdue person for, for probably over 25 years. And I've spoken at this conference, I think, for every one of those 25 or maybe more years, I think. So it's great to be here even, you know, it's nice to have in person, but it did not work out for me this year to make it over to Purdue uh, for this for this particular week. Anyway, it's wonderful to be here. I'm going to be um, talking about inspections and assessments. And um, it's as typically my style, at least what I like to do, how I like to present, is very practical on the job approaches, right? So I'm not gonna be showing a lot of data slides or statistics or anything along those lines. Uh, you know, I was a pest control professional for three years full time, saving money for college. And so I'm always reminding myself of how can I use the information? How can I use the new research? And I am a consultant these days um, and have been for some time now. And I, I guess I'm in the field a lot, you know, just like most of you at this conference. I'm in the field. I'm problem solving constantly. Uh, I'm constantly chasing rats and mice and in all kinds of scenarios, everything from houses to giant shopping malls and airports and, and everything in between. So I'm always considering myself a student of road and pest management. That's where I come from. I'm thinking I'm never going to stop learning this. And every time I go out on a different rodent situation, my slate is completely blank. I go out thinking there's no other account like this. And I want to stress before we even start that there is no such thing as a standard mouse job or a standard rat job. It doesn't exist. So we can't go out with a mindset of, yo, this, this mouse clean out is the same as the other mouse clean up last week or anything like that. Every single one of them are unique. All right. Well, having said that, then we're going to start. Um, I'm, I am going to go through, you know, some slides um, typical of, you know, these large groups and kind of thing. But um, I want to say, Hopefully, you know, we're going to have plenty of time for questions, you know, any question you might have or challenges or something you hear. You know, I have some up-to-date research I think is important at the end to share with road and pest management. So let's get started. Let's let's jump in. I'm going to switch over to my to my screen here. And here we go. Okay, so it's 2023. You know, and um, you know, it's it's been uh, an interesting past couple of years with the pandemic, as we all know. So my assignment this year is, you know, the committee asked me to speak on the whole topic of assessments versus inspections and rodent pest management, right? And these two are linked, as we're going to see. You know, when someone says, "How do we assess the situation?" or, you know, "Here's my assessment of a situation." you know, how do we put that together with our inspections? They're not synonymous. Those two words are not the same thing, but they are kind of kissing cousins in terms of words and actions. And, and so we're going to dive in here with this. And, and just by way of, um, you know, contact, if you need to send me a follow-up question or need something relative to this talk, you know, that I mentioned a point, you can always send me an email at cityrats at mac.com. Um, I've also been on Twitter for a couple of years, um, and that's my handle. It's just, you can put Bobby Cargan, rodentologist. Who knows what's going to happen to Twitter, whether, you know, there's, if you're, if you follow Twitter, which I think is a very, very useful site platform for getting great science. I ignore all the politics on it. I don't, you can follow whoever you want or not follow anybody, but for science, um, it has been one of the most wonderful platforms for keeping up to date and learning a tremendous amount of information in a very short period of time. So you can follow me there. And if you don't find me there, I jumped over to uh, the post, just post. 
Okay, so that's by way of background. I do want to say thanks to Purdue. It's, you know, Purdue is one of the most prestigious pest control conferences anywhere in the world. And even though I'm a Purdue graduate and a Purdue staffer and all of that, and I probably sound biased, it's just simply true, right? Purdue was one of the very first pest control conferences anywhere. And it's had a long history of being, you know, out in front with research and and outstanding speakers and, and so forth. Behind the scenes, you know, there's always people that are absolutely key. And so I do want to do a shout out to Holly Fletcher Timmons. Of course, everybody knows Holly. You know, she's she's the person behind the, the scenes that makes everything happen. And also want to say thanks so much to Kate Goddard, who's been, you know, just taking care of all the IT things and the recordings and, and so forth. And, and especially has been patient with me having to uh, reschedule two or three times to make this happen. So thank you. Thank you both for so much for being patient. You know, most of us know Gene White. Um, Gene's been a speaker at the Purdue Conference and a Purdue grad for, you know, for so many years. And we lost Gene recently and a good friend to many here, many at this, especially at this Purdue Conference, good friend to me over the years and personal friend and so forth. So, you know, I'd like to dedicate uh, this session to Gene. Now, if we shift gears here and, you know, everybody, this is not a basics of which rodents and biology and behavior of the rodents and none of that, you know, that we, we have elsewhere in different sessions and in-house training and so forth. So we're all familiar with the, with the big, you know, three, if we will, the Noi rat or the brown rat that you see here. I love this picture. I use this picture just because this is the real deal. You know, this is how the average brown Norway rat looks in the field wherever you might see it, right? There's no no giant Norway rats. You're never going to hit a two-pounder, even though sometimes some of the dominant males look very large. The typical Norway rat that everyone works with is, is going to come in at, at about, you know, 14 to 16 ounces. It's an unbelievably smart mammal. And the more we study it, the more we realize we've way underestimated how intelligent the rodents are. It, I used to tell all my customers over three years, they're all just varmints and they all just, you know, act from instinct. They don't know what they're doing. It's instinct. And, uh, you know, that's, we now know that's almost a ridiculous thing I said to my customers, you know. So these animals we now know can make decisions. They can actually regret when they make a bad decision. They have emotions. They they have happiness. They have sadness. They have depression, just like other mammals, all of us with mammalian brains and so forth. So, you know, they can use tools. We now know research has proven that they can use tools. And at Purdue Conference, I've even showed you guys, I don't know how many were there, you know, uh, Richmond University of Virginia actually taught rats to drive little tiny cars with gas pedals and steering wheels and having to look out the windshield to find out where is the food and how do I get to it by turning the steering wheel and braking when I get there. So amazing, amazing mammals. The roof rats, there's probably plenty of you with this meeting that are also in states that have roof rats. You know, the classic, it's a smaller, sleeker, slender mammal with a very long tail and loves to get up into, as the name implies, roofs and ceilings and treetops and so forth. Um, even though this mammal is smaller and looks, quote, a little bit less intimidating than in the way we're at, you're, it's actually the king of secretiveness. This animal is so secretive, it, it's incredible. And so for those of you that do roof rats, and especially for technicians that may be new to doing rotor control, if you want to do roof rats, you have to think hard to reach, darkest shadows, very sleek and slender, and very cautious of any changes in their world. You know, so I do want to stress because it's very common, especially again for new technicians, you cannot go by color whenever you work with rats and mice. You cannot go by color, even though we do unfortunately call the noy rat the brown rat and the black rat we call the roof rat. These are both roof rats right here. So the point is they sometimes you have roof rats that look like noways and noways that will look like roof rats. You only can go by the distinguishing very long tail on the roof rats versus the relatively shorter tail on the Norways. And we have other mice that show up in our accounts. 
and all over the United States, outside the houses, but occasionally move into attics and crawl spaces and so forth. And a lot of people, you know, will call these, and this is why I'm doing this, they will say, oh, those are deer mice, or those are white-footed mice, or sometimes they are those are white-footed deer mice, which there are, there's no such species. So this is a peromiscus mouse. Peromiscus meaning pouched cheeks. And it could be, depending on where you live, a deer mouse, or it could be a white-footed mouse. Um, and those are two different species. But occasionally, as especially as we do urban sprawl, they are more and more of a pest throughout the United States, at least to humans, as we build houses on tops of woods and clear woods and clear fields and so forth. Right. So, and you know, so we're all familiar with, with these animals. Now, this this research is not brand new, but I want to re-emphasize it because it's 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 an empirical study that has finally, over the years, documented what does it mean when rodents invade our space? Any of the rodents, not just the big rats, if you will, but someone having a mouse living in their kitchen, you know, or living, seen scurrying about in the basement, you know, by the washing machines or the garage, something really gets to us. In some cases, we don't even register that it gets to us. But the fact of the matter is, um, it does in most cases, some people more than others, of course, and some people actually have a rodent phobia, right, a rodent phobia, it's called musophobia. And, and it's not just a, you know, the stereotyping of, you know, the woman in the house or the man in the house. You know, when I taught at Purdue University for 16 years, I had a football player in one of my classes. He was a linebacker for the Boilermakers, and he was sitting in as a guest, and he was freaked out by a, a live mouse. When we went out to the field, he just really could not handle it. Okay, so there is no stereotyping. Humans, some humans are just okay with wild animals. They're less squeamish, and others are tremendously upset. And so this particular study, which I would encourage every pest professional to download and review, because when we go out to anybody's property, commercial or residential, we need to know that, look, our jobs are really important. Yes, they may do damage and they're contaminating things and so forth, but just people are like, please get rid of these rodents. Just, you know, take care of this. And many of us know that, you know, and, and we cannot take it lightly that, okay, okay, you know, um, calm down. It's just a, just a mouse or it's just a rat. It's serious, right? Fear, anger, stress, worry. These are all measured in this study. Look at the last one, even avoidance behaviors. You know, you ever, you know, bump into a friend or someone at work or something like that and you say, hey, good morning. How's it going? And they just kind of seem like cold and distant. Who knows what's causing them to, you know, on any of us to behave a certain day in any particular way. But rodents really whack us out is the bottom line. Even if sometimes we don't acknowledge it subconsciously, they may be bothering us. And I want to show something here to this point. This is very recent, you know, and I want to show this kitchen. This is a normal kitchen and a nice building. There's nothing unique. This, this is not, you know, any poverty stricken apartment building. This is a, just an average kitchen, an average building with our typical customer. And, and you will see here, this is a rat right behind a tray, right? Right behind, right? It could be your kitchen sink, my kitchen sink. It's, you know, it's very typical, but this is a rat slinking about that the homeowner caught on their phone, so to speak, just a short clipping just a couple of days ago and quite in fact, and so they came from over this area and they're making their way along the counter of this kitchen and they already have a trail. This rat already has a trail that they've been using at night when everybody's sleeping and they didn't even know they had this animal living with them. But let me see. We'll get this video. This happens very quickly, which in itself is very important, is here we are, a rodent invades our space, this wild animal with fur and a long tail invades our space. And, you know, it's there and gone and disappears into these holes. And, and we're like, what was that? You know, people are freaked out. It's like in my kitchen of all places, we had this dirty, filthy varmint, you know, that's scurrying about how long has this been going on? Well, we, especially for the technicians, right? How many times do we hear that kind of a comment? 
It's all the time. You know, and then sometimes they'll say, you know, we have a problem now. I guess I should have called you three months ago. I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye in the kitchen. And but when I looked again, it was gone. I figured, well, maybe that was a one off. I don't know what that was just now. Common, common, super common. The fact of the matter is the industry over the years, we've made probably billions of dollars on that exact association between us and this wild animal, whether it be a rat or a mouse. Now, certainly the rat has a much greater presence. That's going to get anybody's attention. That's the average noy rat right there that we've seen. So let's see how fast this goes down here. In seconds, it's over. In seconds, that animal, that big animal is able to scurry by without necessarily disturbing anything, didn't knock over any dishes, didn't knock over any, nothing, right? Now, if, if we go back to this, look at the tail, slinks around. That one picture in someone's mind of that tail is part of the reason so many people, human beings, hate rats and mice. It's this kind of like a snake-like, disgusting slithering of this, you know, tail that touches all kinds of things and, and wraps around things. And it's a snake-like, which is one of our other most common situations where human beings, when we list our most despised animals for us as a species, Snakes always come up number one. We have this inherent hardwired fear of snakes. And so rodents with these long tails, you know, that drag behind them and slink around things and what have you, really visually whack us out, right? So I wanted to start us out with this because, you know, we have to go out with a mindset. In fact, we have to go out being very mindful with everything that word means, being mindful, we're being paid to take care of things that are really important. Now, who knows what this rat's doing in this particular house? Is it gnawing on wires? They love to gnaw on wires, as we'll talk about when we talk about inspections part of this. Is it defecating onto food? Iron? Everything it touches in that kitchen, guaranteed, if you now take a Q-tip and run it over that kitchen sink where it just was, for example, where we wash dishes, prepare food on the counter and so forth. You take a Q-tip and you run that and you put it into a microbiology lab, it's going to come back positive. But stuff, microbial pathogens, perhaps. This is why, too, when I tell the public, I said, look, if you see rodents inside your house, uh, don't do it yourself. Call a professional. You know, it's easy to get online and go to the hardware store and get the traps yourself. And it's, you're in over your heads, including for mouse jobs. All right. So we want to make sure we go in full responsibility, fully mindful, not mindless of putting out a couple of glue traps or snap traps. And, you know, you know then the homeowner might as well have done that themselves. Because that's the whole point to this session is we need to assess this now. We need full assessment. Okay. So I don't know. Yeah, you have a rat in the kitchen and disappeared to a wall. Boy, I'll, I'll put out some snap traps or glue boards and let's see what happens. I'll come back in a couple of days. No, they, people have to live with this. So we want to make sure we take care of business, all right? So there it is. Boom, gone. Seconds. There's that tail grossing people out. So let's talk about <clears throat> these two cool key, key words. I'm going to take a drink here. We're going to start out with this comment, a clear understanding of what causes, drives, and sustains pest invasions, right? That's a pest invasion just now, right? So, and then we match up quality equipment with a skilled service to that specific infestation is our identity and is the reason you can justify professional fees, right? That's the key. I could also put up another slide here that just says equipment is not pest control. Equipment is not pest control. It's just tools, right? We match it up to quality equipment. We cannot do without quality equipment. Make no mistake about that. 
But quality equipment put out mindlessly is not going to do much good. And when it doesn't work, we'll say, well, I, you know, I don't know. Maybe the rodents are afraid of it or maybe that equipment's not as good. I, you know, it's about us getting out there with that clear understanding. That's assessing. We have to ask ourselves what's causing, what's driving, what's sustaining this situation that I'm in right now. Now, you know, in 2020, I wrote this and PCT made it into a cover story. It ties in. I'm not showing this promote my own writings, but, you know, it shows that, you know, what we are, what you are attending this, what I am, what we're, you're actually an observational biologist. By, by default, you are. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you don't have you say, well, I don't, I'm not a biologist, I don't have a degree in biology. No, but you are a biology. You're working it every single day. You are a biologist. Every day you're looking at animals and their behavior and relating it to structures and to events and so forth. By default, you are that. Okay, and so it's a situation of you, we can't go out and make the equipment to be the pest control. As I just stated, we must go out just like you know, we showed in this graphic on the cover, as you're walking, you know, let's just say that home is one of your stops, whatever. as you're even walking to the home, after you arrive, all kinds of things should be popping into your head, grabbing your attention, being observant, versus just looking around, right? So we owe it to our customers, whether commercial or residential, we owe it to them to say, okay, you know, if I do a pilot's walkabout, we'll call it a pilot's walkabout even, just like we see pilots walk about our planes, they're like, they're not mechanics. So they're not saying, oh, I need to fix the tires. But they're looking for like, okay, what do I see that? And what do I observe that maybe I need to call the mechanic and we'll stay by the gate here for another 20 minutes. Because this looks weird. So we could do a pilot's walkabout, of course, but we're doing a professional walkabout is how does every single thing on any client on the outside affect what's going on. What do we assess? That's what we're about. So here are just seven, right? But I pick up for me when I go out and I look at rotor problems, you know, these are the key seven that I always work with. But, you know, you can even flush it out deeper and deeper. It depends on, you know, how complex the problem is. But these are key on the job assessment points, OTJ. First, of course, we want to at least get a feeling for what the pest pressure is on an account. And that word's really critical. You know, every building, wherever you are in your home and wherever you may be, and even if you're sitting down to have dinner, you know, at a restaurant with your family or friends or, or someplace, there's pest pressure on our buildings. These animals were here before we bring, brought our cities up. So... I want to talk about the helicopter view on that in terms of being a good assessor and how we can use technology. Two, of course, things start on the outside, right? Just like we just looked in that graphic, you start on the outside. Is What's going on out here? Is the customer inadvertently doing their garbage correctly? Just as an example, an easy, that's the 101 example. What people, A lot of people amazingly do not know how to do their own garbage now, we can grin and smirk all we want about that, but the fact of the matter is most, most people say, take out the garbage, they take out the garbage, they throw it in the can, and maybe they miss the can, it falls on the ground, and I'll get it in the morning, and they go, boop, back to bed. Okay? So we all know that. Now, maybe if everybody did the garbage perfectly and got an A-plus on their garbage report card, um, it would be a lot less business, a lot less business for our industry. Number three... Of course, how tight is the building? How tight is the building? If if we kept all our buildings tight as a smart move, as homo sapiens, we're called a smart human being, homo sapiens, that's what it means. If we keep our buildings tight and they can't get in, well, then there's not going to be a pest issue like just what we saw with that rat. Somehow that rat got in. So we mostly think about doors and other penetrations, mostly, right? But again, we could have a whole entire, you know, course and just pest proofing. Interior, same thing, tightness. 
What about tightness? You know, what about the pipes? What, what about the lines? If there's something put through a wall, is it sealed correctly and, and so forth? We're going to have the sanitation and refuse clutter, of course. And we're going to have in number six critical. I mean, these are these are seven of my favorite points. I'm, you know, they're all important, but interior behavioral spots. Rodents have very specific spots. They will go over and over and over and over again. It's our job as professionals to know where those are and to inspect those using the word inspect and see, are they using them? And I'll show you a research paper that we just did not too long ago, Cornell University, myself and others. And we proved that you put your equipment where the behavioral spots are, your equipment works. If you miss those spots, you just put them down anywhere, they remain empty. And finally, now with new technology, new technology, we, we can monitor. It's critical for assessing. So for those of you, you know, that are not up to speed on monitoring yet, it, it's way past time to jump in. Now you'll see I have their EAS and remotes. And by EAS, there's monitors now, as I mentioned, that are put into equipment. And they tell you the equipment activity sensors. In other words, is there a mouse or rat in the trap or caught in the trap or, or not? Do I have to even bother, you know, go and look at it or is, is it still okay? And then we have sensors that are remote that you can, you know, hook up and you hook up to a cellular network or whatever network. And you could have a sensor in California, you be in New York, you're going to get the alert, right? So those, those are there. You know, it would, I would be amiss if I did not mention this scientist. And I hope as we talk about assessments and biological observations, Without a doubt, we're looking at the man, right? And hopefully some of you know, but if you don't, this is E.O. Wilson, a very famous ampiologist at Harvard University for many, many years, many years. And he just passed last December, almost to the day, you know, of, of when, you know, we, we're talking about the conference. But on December 26th, E.O. passed away. He's one of the most world famous observational biologists. And he wrote Pulitzer Award winning books. And his specialty was ants, which is a myrmecologist. Someone who studies ants is a myrmecologist. And, you know, PCT Magazine at an ant conference one year had EO as the, as the speaker, as the, uh, the keynote. And it was just like, Oh my goodness, to have EO in the room was something else, right? So as we talk about assessments and behavior and observations and these kinds of things, since he just passed a year ago, you know, to his very famous quote, to the lazy hunter, the woods are always empty. This is out of his own biography, which is called The Naturalist, which to me is one of my lifetime favorite books over and over again, I like to read it to be inspired. Uh, you know, it's it's just, it, he's, you know, talking not only about inspecting for animals and what have you, but also just, you know, what kind of a hunter are you in your own life? How awake are you? You know, it's back to that mindfulness message. But every account we go into to which we are being paid to some degree, we can use that analogy. Yep, of course, we're the hunter. Even if a customer says, you know, I don't have any problems. Things are going well. It's no complaints. So do your thing, so to speak, and let me know when you're done and I'll sign your ticket. Well, we want to challenge ourselves, say, hey, is anything going on here that the customer is not even aware of? Just like that rat in the apartment in that house. It's like, whoa, how long has this been going on? In the middle of the night, not making any sound, you know? So we want to make sure we're not lazy. So when we look at the exterior assessments, right, if we jump in here and we just look at a couple of things, right, I would imagine, but I'm going to say it anyway, that all of us now realize the incredible power of assessments using Google Earth, the incredible power. So of course, 
any address you put in, you know, Google Earth now can take you right to their backyard, right to their front yard. It's it's almost a good thing, scary thing kind of thing, right? But we all hear ourselves ask this question before we head out to that new call. That sounds like a problem. What are we getting into? Because we all know the pain of we get to some place and it's so bad in terms of conducive conditions that uh, we probably are not going to be able to do much good. And they're probably not going to pay for us to stay there long enough to do much good. Other cases, we get there and it's it's quite easy. And it's like, boy, this is going to be a dream. You know, we're going to be, you know, be able to solve this quickly. And their conducive conditions are low and they're very cooperative and they're going to listen to our recommendations. And callbacks are going to be very, very low, if any. But we don't know. But Google Earth sure can give us a, a red flag. Is like, whoa, be careful, be careful before you accept. It's like, sure, we'll take it on and we'll send out someone to, to write it up and give you a quote and so forth. So I use Google Earth almost every single time I'm headed to problem account or a consulting visit or, or any place I need to go to assess a rodent situation. So here's, here's Google Earth, of course, right? You, Everyone's probably Google Earth, your own neighborhood, your yards, and what have you. But but this is a typical suburban area, you know, houses out, you know, outside a, a city area. You can see in Google Earth right away, if Google Earth would show this to us, and you're going to service one or two houses, or you've been called to this area for one or two houses, right away you're thinking, holy cow, let's get back to that paramiscus mouse thing. Because there are thousands of paramiscus mice living right here. There's so much harborage. There's so much dead wood. There's nooks and crannies of trees. But this particular neighborhood, people are saying we have chipmunks. We have the little gray mice, the house mouse. We have the pretty mice, the paramiscus mice. Occasionally, there's even been a rat. And for the wildlife trappers that are here and the wildlife managers that are here, there's definitely tree squirrels. There's definitely raccoons. And, and so just this one seemingly simple Google Earth in any place in the world is going to tell us the pest pressure on all these houses here on those mammals I just listed is heavy. So of course, the next kinds of things that come to mind is well, you know, hopefully all these houses are tight. They're structurally tight. Well, the fact of the matter is we know quite a few of them are not going to be structurally tight. Most of them do not know how to pest proof a door or garage door or their sheds or the guard sheds, and they need all kinds of professional advice in that regard. So we just look at this and right away we say, well, it's a natural. These houses are all plucked down into a very pretty spot in, in the neighborhood. And people are putting out barbecues and people are, you know, have garages with bird seeds stored in them and so forth. And so, of course, all the natural animals of this area just think, well, we have trees and we have other kinds of trees. We don't know. These trees are pretty cool. You know, they you move into their, you know, crawl space and wow, predators. I don't even smell predators down here. So Google Earth right away is just a small kickoff. And if we have, let's just say you're headed, you got a call from this house in the center. It's like, oh, okay, well, let me check it. You can see, well, it's pretty thick back here with trees and, and they're very close to some neighbors here. And they do have a garage shed. And I'll be darned, look at this. They have a dog house. And, and right away, you start thinking, before you even get there in your vehicle, you're already, I have a pretty good idea of, of what the complaint's going to be and what it's about. Now, I'm just talking vertebrates. We can switch this entire thing over with the carpenter ants, for example. And, oh, okay, this is, is this carpenter ant country? Uh, heck yes. How about odorous house ants? Well, oh, off we go. So, but then we can switch to a commercial assessment. Again, same thing. This is, this is Google Earth looking down, you know, just in a typical commercial little strip of shops and restaurants and the, the cute little areas and what have you. But all these stores to the left here, with the, with the pink, long pink structure here. We'll just go down this street. There's restaurants here, there's little shops and what have you, there's restaurants across the street. We even have a rail spur that's very active and it's going through here and have the rights of way and the typical cover of the rights of way. And so, but 
we have a call from some restaurants and some office buildings in this area for radishes. This is real. I'm telling to you because, you know, that's why I'm showing it for me. To, and I'm like, okay, so we get the picture pretty quick. Now, the frustration is if you work or have a business in this one white building across from this pink structure, you're affected by every one of your neighbors and they're affected by you. Now, this is a restaurant here. Very popular restaurant, and we can see the you know the you know the typical scenario behind the restaurant, a little tiny shed that looks really messy, and it is. And as they keep this messy, full of grease and what have you, and they also they share over here a whole bay of dumpsters and garbage cans or what have you. And we have this whole green space. We start to see litter. This is from Google Earth, helicopter view, helicopter. We start to see this over here is really messy. So this whole area is under great rat pressure that they, quote, they created. Now, the bottom line is actually only one or two property owners here are the bad players. And this is why a local board of health Inspector is the community's best, best friend. Because yeah, they can hire us, but they may this this restaurant may hire one company, this office or is another, this is a third pest control professional, and over here is a fourth. You know, what are we all doing? So it's the case, but sorry, but you're all, whether you like it or not, you're all one big happy family with pest pressure of the same species. Now, until you all get together, a health inspector, make sure you all get together. This has got to be fixed. This has got to be fixed. And if not, I guess we'll have to levy fines. So we go to that spot, right? We were here. Let's go to the bottom right where the, where the bay is. You don't care about focus or clarity. It doesn't matter for Google Earth. All you can see is, oh yeah, this is this is a mess. I don't need to see the detail here. I'll take care of that when I do my inspection, but assessing it just before I even get there, this is sloped. Noi rats, for example, they love slopes. So these are there's rat burrows in here, I can tell you from the visit. And this is their feeding grounds. This is their feeding grounds every single night. You know, cars, sometimes they'll get underneath these cars, sometimes even chewing the wires. And people say, oh, they, they love soy wires. You know, <laughs> not true. You know, that's not the big deal. So we have now we have a closer view of some things here. And here we have garbage cans that are messy, greasy. We're assessing these situations. Well, how strong are you pulling these rodents to this particular restaurant? Extremely strong. I'm assessing your garbage. And it's very bad. Even though they'll say, well, these cans are empty most nights. Well, the cans are empty, but the grease streaks are. When's the last time you cleaned them? The grease alone. And then your door here, there's a hole in your door because there were rats in the ceiling. I was in these ceilings. So oh, how had this happen? I'm like, well, I assess your situation. You're in a high pest pressure zone because of your neighbors and yourself. And you don't do your trash correctly. And you let them in. And now you think, well, it's simple. Just call an exterminator. They'll get rid of them. But we need to fix some things, right? We need... we. Some things are going to be really, really simple. We're going to we're going to pest proof your door for you. We have great technology to do that. Here's what it's going to cost. This we're going to give you a fact sheet on how to take care of these refuse bins and so forth, so you don't have to do this all, and you don't suck rodents to your literally to your property every single night. And because they'll do this, and I you know I took this picture of doors and and scenario just like this. And this is rats. They will. This is a rat that went right underneath the restaurant door. This is their tooth marks. You know, as I'll mention later, under inspections, these these measure, you know, two to four, you know, millimeters of the rodent width. But with rats, it's four. With mice, it's two. We'll come back to that. But this rat drilled this strip just in about probably 15, 20 minutes the night of and just went in and said, I'm in because this is weather stripping, which does nothing to keep rodents out. You need rodent stripping. You need rodent proofing. So those are the two key numbers when we're assessing. Two millimeters, four millimeters. Mice, tooth marks, rats. Now, again, if you measure with a little ruler, which you should always have, that measures across there, four millimeters. Now, if that was two with a good millimeter, good ruler, just a simple ruler you can buy at Home Depot. If it's two, it's always mice. If it's four, it's always rats. 
So this is out of my own textbook. You know, I just wanted to illustrate it to show that, you know, they get through, this is a mouse getting through a hole. And I said, put a ruler in my illustration, please. It shows for a mouse, it's when they enter those doors, it's only, they only need six millimeters. It's a rat, they need 12. So there are two sets of numbers on your assessments that are absolutely critical to making the assessment is what is going on here and who's involved. Kind of like, I always like to say, look, kind of like Sherlock Holmes, like, look, I know exactly what's going on here. I figured this out, I'm putting the pieces together. And we see that, you know, this is not mice because the space was 12 millimeters high. You know, this is not rats and whatever it is, you know, we put it together. There's a hotel room that I inspected for a very famous hotel super famous and you know they they had a mouse show up at one of the most embarrassing situations of a dignitary from around the world and uh, you can imagine the, this person made a big stink about it and so forth and it was a big to do so the hotel said wow we have a good pest control service what are we what are we supposed to do and they said well you do have a good pest control service except you have to do your doors and this is a close-up of your doors. They could not believe a mouse could get through that space from the hallway into each of the rooms uh, with this, these old, this was a historic hotel kind of thing. I, I said, they don't even have to duck. They don't have to squeeze. They just walk in to the hotel room and, you know, do whatever they want. So, you know, it, it's, it's the case of hallway mice foraging about, in this case, straight in. This is the back of a food plant warehouse distribution center. And... You know, I'm working with a group of partners. I said, whoa, look look at the road impression in the back of this building. You, you have rats running back and forth, back and forth. And they said, how in the world, how in the world do you, can you see that so clearly? I said, there's nothing that's going to make a trail like that on the back of a wall. It's all bedded down every single night. It can't be a raccoon. It can't be a squirrel. That's rodents, classic rodents, you know, and I assess that let's figure out where they're going, where they're coming from. Right. So all of this can be done, you know, with rulers, simple rulers, simple tools put to good, put to good use. Now, on the inside with rodents, we once they get in, as we just seen, then they start using the interiors of buildings, of course. And as I started out with, you know, these animals are just terrific, terrific, adaptable, smart animals that they will learn their ways around our buildings while we're sleeping or we're not there if it's a business. You know, they're doing their full explorations night after night till they got it down solid. They will know their buildings after just a couple of weeks of solid explorations, which places are which, where do I travel? How do I get from my nest to the food, the most direct route? How do I do it quietly so no one sees me or hears me or kills me, so forth. So I took this picture of, of this rat in a super famous chain restaurant, you know, just going up and down. This is during the day, by the way, when I took this picture, there were rats going up and down that wire, you know, bundle, like just one after the other. And, and I said, well, you know, we, you know, we need to get rid of these rats. I'm like, uh, yeah, this is, it is a restaurant there. You got hundreds of them living in your ceiling. Right. And I had to close that restaurant down. I just said, you absolutely cannot stay open. So they will leave signs, of course, you know, on the outside, this is what we call sebum mixed in with urine and all kinds of secretions, ural genital secretions, you know, you can imagine, you know, uh, that's not only on the surface, but this is refreshed every single night by the rodent colony living in these burrows here. They mark these so they know their front door. They leave droppings so they know their own family unit. These are deliberate. There are the pheromones in here that communicate to the rota family, hey, you're with us. Well, you're not with us, right? And strangers that come here and smell these sometimes, so, whoa, uh, this is a dominant male that I met a couple weeks ago and he almost killed me. And so they may keep moving. Sometimes, however, There'll be a certain traction where there'll be a tribe. There may be a, a female in heat that will smell a dominant male's droppings and search him out. That often is the case. That's how many times they, they start new families and colonies and so forth. So, but this is clear. Of course, 
you know, this almost warrants no comment, but I, I, we have to comment that sometimes just stop, be mindful whenever you see cardboard boxes, any place, residential, commercial, cardboard boxes and rodents are the most hand in, you know, love thing we come across. It's super common to have mice and rats love to move into boxes. Now, sometimes what I like to do is you don't have to pull these boxes down or open. You don't have to do that. If there's any rodents using boxes like this shoved up and, you know, and down below up and all you need to do is look for a dropping. If you see any droppings or a dropping in, in these kinds of areas or on top of the box, those boxes need to be, now they need to be pulled. But rodents and cardboard, uh, especially house mice, you know, this is the this is the basement of a of a restaurant. Right above, there's a restaurant here, and you know they had a serious serious shutdown by the board of health and what have you. And and so, you know, I inspected these boxes. Said, you know, if we've got three or four boxes with mouse nests, not just a mouse or two, they, there's nests in these, you know, but they couldn't see it because all the entry was on the backside and and so forth, and the mice were coming and going from the backside which that's what they do. They'll say, I don't want to give myself away. So they'll, they'll do the backside. This is Tim Maderi out of New Orleans, outstanding, outstanding rodentologist. He, he sent me a picture of one of his videos and he said, look at this, check this out. And we don't have time to show the whole film, but he said the base station, they just, they completely ignore it. All these young follow mom, right? And I said, yeah, you know, this was infrared and why are they ignoring it? As I'll mention a little bit with new studies, it's in a bad spot with food that's rarely available, that's been available for some time. And when they have that scenario, they just don't bother. Very, very important that we keep that in mind that you can't just drop equipment every 50 feet or someplace and say, they're going to be going into the bait box because they smell the bait. It does not work like that. They don't go into the bait box because they smell the bait. Right? We have to convince them that it's worth going into our bait boxes, not come on into the bait box, please. We have to make the behavioral smart move. Now, if we take these assessment pieces, right? And all I did is just show some examples, right? In a short period of time that we have together today. So let's just look at now some inspection points specifically. Right. And I did touch on a few of these, but of course, we know when we look for rodents, we know that we have on the job, we're going to encounter droppings, you know, sebum, which in my opinion is even far more important than spotting droppings. Sebum will take you to the sources, they'll take you to the nest zones, they'll take you to their travel ways, you know. So, sebum is, in my opinion, the most important inspection point you could focus on. Sometimes it's hair stuck to the sebum and so forth, especially as they come and go from holes. There's burrows and structural holes, you know, into walls and, and so forth. There's tracks, there's no marks. I even just showed some. So that one we have down. And I want to stress number six, any young rodent occurrences is critical to know because with, with young rodents, whenever you spot them, it's a gift to your service efficiency. When you see a young rodent, you're very close to where their nest is. For example, if you see a young mouse, you could spin in a circle and within 10 foot radius of that pup is very likely where the nest is located. Now that's great because our job is to eliminate sources wherever we can. If it's a rat, one of the two rats, either one, you're within about a 25 foot radius of where that that young animal came from, right? So it's it's the case of when we focus down on the inspection. Let's let's talk about droppings. Let me get a drink of water. All right. So when we talk about droppings here. You know, it's, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, are they fresh or are they old? So these are fresh. They tend to be jet black when they're fresh and moist, right? And they get gray and dusty, but there's some exception to that. But generally, droppings that look like this, very jet black, very moist looking. If you do this moisture, they're fresh. Right. So then we have we have our structural holes, obviously here. 
to the left, by the garbage cans, no secret there. Now, when you look at holes, however, and in structures and in vegetation, and these happen to be very cleverly put into shadows, you know, below things, you know, it's it's a case of they know that they don't want to, if they can help it, put that bar right out in the visibility area, right? Although they will do it when they have to, right? When you see a bar in the middle of no place like this, it usually means there wasn't great room left in the best spots. And there's a lot of rodents in those areas. Into the structures up close, here we have all that great sebum. And in fact, we look closely, we do a little bit of Sherlock Holmes here, we look a little bit closer, you'll see hair stuck into the sebum. That is fresh as a daisy. When I took this picture, I, even as I got close, it just smelled so zooey. It smells like you're in a zoo, you know, where there's a lot of smell of wild animals and their excrement and their bodies and so forth. And there we get even closer. And sometimes now, you know, it's just fun to put a, you know, little scoping camera on the end of a, you know, you can buy those online and just put it in there with a little light and you're in there, you're in their house. Okay, here's another example where they mark it up into a burrow. Another sebum, sebum, sebum is, is where I'm going with this. Sebum, sebum. There's hair being scraped off as they come and go from a hole in, in a structural wall. So. We have rat tracks when we have when we do inspections in the dirt and the goo. Goo, we know what goo means. <laughs> it's a pretty simple word, right? But yeah. anyway, we know that rodents, both species, rats and mice have five toes in the front, digits we call them, and four in the back. Five and four. So, and this is goo. This happens to be in the back of a bakery I was in. I, believe it or not, believe it or not, a bakery, very famous, lines every Sunday morning to get their bagels and rolls. In the back room is, you know, every night, rats, those are all rats, you know, running up through there. Rat print is full one inch. It was mice to be less than a half an inch. Then no marks, as I mentioned, you know, this is classic garbage can, heavy, heavy duty garbage can. Well, the rodents, the rats thing is not heavy duty to us. We bite at 7,000 pounds with square pressure at six bites per second. We go through your plastic garbage cans, anything else plastic in, in seconds, okay? Wires, this is a rodent. Why do they do wires? Because of this. Rodents have been doing stems and plant vegetative stems for eons and eons and eons of times. And whenever they come across something that looks like that shape, is that shape, you know, they've like, hey, when I know into wires and stuff, maybe I'll get fresh water, I'll get bugs, I'll get juices, maybe I'll get, you know, some sweet nectar. It, it's about that. So whenever we're in ceilings, I took this picture in a fast food restaurant where you know, the rodents were ripping apart their wires in, in the ceiling, as you can see, and they were constantly having leaks of their soda lines and so forth. And, uh, you know, I, I was like, well, you need pest control in the ceiling. Where's your pest control in the ceiling? In this case, there it was none. And so I said, well, you know, we, we're going to fix this pretty quick, actually. But, you know, you didn't need a consultant to climb up and ride and tell you this is where the work was needed. So finally, as I wrap up here and stop you guys, and, you know, we'll, we're going to be taking questions and so forth. But as I mentioned, there's new technology. And as I stressed, if we're doing assessments, you know, and trying to figure out what's the big picture, now we have technology that can help us tremendously. And there's several different sensors and sensor types, right? So, you know, I'm not promoting anybody's product or anything. I'm just, I'm familiar with this one, very familiar with this one and been using it extensively in, in my rodent research, you know, but we have all new technologies coming out. You know, we, this is the, you know, equipment activity sensors that work on Bluetooth, for example, out of the Bell's lineup. But uh, during this conference, make sure you visit the product specialist and there's a session that you hear on sensors and using sensors for rodent monitoring, which please, please you make sure you catch. It's very, very critical that we stay up to date. And finally, you know, this is only gonna take a, a second here. I just wanted to update you that 
there's you got to keep up with the research. And last year in 2021, you know, we published our work out of Cornell University, where we talk about where you put your equipment is everything. Doesn't matter if you have a great bait station and great bait in that bait station. If you put it in the bad spot, it's a bad bait station, bad bait. So you can catch up October 15, 2021, PCT. Matt Fry, he was a senior author on, on this study out of Cornell. You know, he talks about do you place your equipment or do you space it? Right. So, but one thing's for sure is just dropping equipment every 50, 100 feet, 25 feet is. It's, you know, to use, be simple, it's mindless. We want to be mindful about this. We want to be really thinking it through. So, and I'm just going to skip it here. This paper is also, this was, you know, just last year, you know, recently, and existence of wild brown rats that are indifferent to new objects. Now, I want to stress that this does not mean that they're afraid of new objects forever. I told my customers, oh, rats are afraid of new bait stations, afraid of traps, and they got to get accustomed to them. Well, now we know that that's not true. It's It comes down to this. Rodents will ignore our equipment if everything remains the same. In other words, if they've been feeding on this garbage for six months, and it's always there and it's always like this and it's always nutritious because it's fully balanced. In fact, they're living in this wall here, by the way. They have no need to switch over to a brand new bait station, no matter what bait's put inside, soft bait, hard bait, any bait. They're like, who cares? Everything's working. What do you, so go away. Well, I don't know what that black box is and I don't care. So unless we fix this, putting out a bait station with fresh bait is, Sometimes I hear people say, hey, well, every little bit will help. And this will, I know they it'll help them a little bit. Well, what's a little bit? A little bit's pretty little is, is the answer. All right. This is why on our labels, it says, these, remove as much alternative food as possible. I, I, I just think the customer and sometimes our industry in general, we don't really stress that enough. And it's, in my opinion, the most seven most important words on the label, short of everything about safety. Our research, this is out of the paper, has proven that wild noy rats within their colonies have a total disregard for anything in their foraging range that is unfamiliar to them when all else is working in their favor. All right, that's... Just one sentence. That's the sentence I extracted from that paper because it affects our industry like a, a total bomb going off as, as to a wake up call. Our customers need to be aware. And here's what I would personally like to see to that point for every customer, even almost somebody should make it a law. You know, dear client that you've hired us, exclusion services are bar none, the most long-term and cost-effective solution we at ABC, whatever the name of your company is, can sell you. Please initial here. Number two, and for any baiting services that you purchase from us, their effectiveness depends, not in, I don't say important, it depends on the removal as much of refuse food as possible. Please initial here. Because for them not to be aware of those two critical things and yet cut us a check for, say, putting out base stations or trying to bail out the ocean with a teaspoon because the doors are letting in rodents every single night, it's just, it's just it's a very uncomfortable position to be in on both sides of this. So my summary comment is a question. Isn't every engaged? And engage, we know there's some clients, they don't really care, right? We know this. You show up, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. Just, I'm busy. Leave me alone. Do your thing and, and send me the bill or send me the ticket. They're not engaged. They don't want to be engaged. Some are like, do something magical. I don't know what you're going to do. Just do it, you know? It's very frustrating for every technician where we have a non-engaged client that, that want miracles, yet they're not going to do their own garbage. And they'll yell at us for not getting rid of the rodents. So, but for every engaged client, we do have plenty. We owe it to them to make sure they're familiar with assessment, what we learned from assessing their property and keep them with progress reports, obviously, 
right? And this is where, again, monitors can prove progress. Instead of saying, well, I saw less this month. Well, what does that mean? Does less mean 10, zero, what? what? There's less in the traps this month. There's less baits being hit this month, you know? So monitors really give us these dashboards and everything. Okay, so I am cutting it very close. I appreciate the opportunity again to Purdue University. You know, I thank you very much and I'll be uh, standing by for questions. So at this time, I will um, stop my presentation and we'll, we'll go to the Q&A. Thank you again.